Hey everyone, welcome to Baltimore County Fire Department EMS Academy. For those who I haven't met, my name is Sean Barinholtz. I am an anesthesia and ICU physician in Hopkins. I'm an active member of Pikesville Volunteer Fire Company in Baltimore County, and I serve as one of the associate medical directors for Baltimore County Fire Department. On behalf of Dr. Andy Pollack in the medical director's office, on behalf of the EMS office, Chief Nats, EMS Training Academy staff, and Captain Lenny Stewart, Thank you guys for what you do every day. Thank you for your dedication to lifelong learning. Shout out to Ashley Brooks, a young member of Pikesville is helping us. It should be helping us with our with um, live chat, our chat. Um, uh, Ashley isn't able to join us tonight, but that. she I did just, provide us much. with uh, a link. I'll send that link out in the chat towards the end of the presentation. Click on the link, fill out some information and get your MIM CEUs. If you have any questions about your MIM CEUs, certificates of participation or your record of uh, classes that you've attended, please stay on with us after the session, training session. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, we need to resolve any sign-ins for CEUs tonight before the platform closes. I'm not allowed to get an email to set, to enter somebody's information tomorrow, for example, if you email and said that you had any difficulty signing in. So if you have any challenges with signing in, again, stay with us at the end and we will make sure that we answer your questions. Tonight, super, super delighted to have back with us again, Karen Gonzalez and Amy Miles. Uh, Karen is a stroke coordinator at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center and stroke certified registered nurse since 2015. She previously cared for stroke patients on the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Stro Center Stroke Unit. Amy Miles has been in the emergency department, uh, been an emergency department nurse since 2004. She currently serves in various leadership roles and works clinically in the ED at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center. Hey, you guys, thank you so much for being with us again and sharing you know, your ongoing commitment, right? To getting stroke education out there uh, to our EMS providers. We are very grateful for your time and your expertise. Thanks for having us. All right. So Sean said, I am Karen Gonzalez. I'm the stroke coordinator at St. Joe's. So we're going to just talk about stroke 101. What you know. Okay, Amy. Next one. So, Karen, we're definitely breaking up again. Oh, I don't mm. know what to do. Um, let Maybe, me see if how I can... about you could one option I've seen other speakers do is turn off your video. Okay, I can do that. Maybe then this is and maybe save some internet bandwidth. All right, let me know if it. It's messed up. Send me a text, Amy. All right. So um, first thing, as you all know, when it comes to stroke, time equals brain. So the quicker we can identify a stroke and treat the stroke, the, the less brain cells we'll lose for our patients. So just some facts about stroke. About 795,000 people have a stroke every year. Some of the U.S. has one every 30, 40 seconds. So pretty prevalent. Nearly one in four people who have had a previous, have had the stroke, have had a previous stroke. It's the fifth leading cause of death in the United States. And in 2018, one of every six deaths from cardiovascular disease was due to stroke. So what this means equals to is someone dies from a stroke every four minutes. So spotting the stroke in the field is really important. We get the people to the hospital and we can hopefully save them the disability and save their life as well. There are things about strokes, um, things about people that they can change and they can work on to prevent a stroke. And there's some things that we can't change. Things that they can't change are their age, their gender, their genetics, where they, what their family background is, their ethnicity. If they've had a stroke or a TIA, that makes them more prone to another stroke. But things we do teach people that they can work on to prevent a stroke is hypertension, that diabetes, dyslipidemia, atrial fibrillation, sleep apnea, obesity, smoking, alcohol abuse, and illicit drug use. And the reason we, we teach these, we teach these to the community, we teach these to our nurses, and we teach these to you, um, is because up to 80% of all second strokes can be prevented by controlling risk factors. That's really important. So this is the warning sign. TIAs are transient ischemic, ischemic attacks. And um, 
that's um, or mini strokes. So what is less than five? Less than five means that they usually last less than five minutes. They can last longer, but generally speaking, the symptoms are less than five minutes. Zero. That means when we do imaging of the brain, there is no trace that they've had any damage to their brain because the um, TIA is transient. So there's no permanent brain damage. When there's permanent damage, it's a stroke. 7.6, 7.6 million people have had a TIA. So um, we know they've had TIAs and we know they're pretty prevalent. And what's the question mark? Well, we're not sure if that's really accurate because some people have TIA symptoms, like they'll have a facial droop or they'll have left arm weakness and then it gets better. So they're like, oh, I'm not gonna go to the emergency room because it's better. And so that's why that 7.6 may not be as accurate as we would hope. So what can we do we, for our stroke patients? We have two treatments for acute stroke. One is thrombolytic therapy. So what's really important about this is knowing the last time they were normal or without stroke symptoms, because we have from the time they are normal up to four and a half hours to treat them with the thrombolytic. That's the IV push medic, the IV medication. Right now we're using Alteplase. And in December, we're going to switch as a system for the University of Maryland hospitals are switching to Tenecteplase. The other treatment we can have for, for people is a endovascular clot retrieval. And what that means is they go up and they take the clot out of the brain. That window is from zero to 24 hours from the time they're last known well. And that's why it's really important. No matter when people have had their stroke symptoms, we need to know when's the last time they were normal because that's how we determine if, what treatment we can give them, if any. So St. Joe's that where I work is a primary stroke center. And what that means is we have standardized methods to deliver care. So we have, we use AHA guidelines, American Stroke Association guidelines. We use EMS um, Maryland mandates and we have our MIMS designation. So um, the Maryland mandates that EMS arrives to a P PSC um, unless it's less than 30 minutes. And then they're gonna go to a comprehensive stroke center for those lambs greater than four. And we'll cover that again in a, in a little bit. A comprehensive stroke center is a larger stroke center. They take care of those complex strokes. So they take care of patients that have subarachnoid hemorrhage or a really large bleed. If they have a stroke that's really big, big and we're afraid that there's going to be swelling in the brain, so we send them there as well. And they also do the endovascular. They go in and take the clot out. And they have 24-7 neurosurgery available at a comprehensive stroke center. So comprehensive stroke centers in um, Maryland are Hopkins, Hopkins Bayview, University of Maryland Medical Center. And then there's two thrombectomy capable centers that can also do the procedure. That would be Sinai and now, now is um, Franklin Square as well. So what is a stroke? So a stroke is when there's rapid death to blood tissue. That means there's a disturbance in the, in the supply of blood to the brain. So in our first picture here, this is an ischemic stroke. So when you look at this, um, there, this part here, where it's, it's dark, this is the dead tissue, that's the ischemia. And then the next one is a hemorrhagic stroke. So where it's white, that's where there's blood and we don't wanna see that either. So when people come to the hospital, we're do, gonna do a CAT scan and we're gonna look, look for two things. If we see there's already a stroke, it's too late to treat. And if we see blood, then we're not gonna give them a blood thinner to, to break up a clot. They need a different sort of treatment. So either way, this is a medical emergency. So easy way to remember, ischemic stroke is like the clogged pipe and a hemorrhagic stroke is like the leaky pipe. So the ischemic stroke is usually, it's a clot that's, or a fragment. Something is clogging it up so blood can't flow through. So it's either a blood clot, like when people have AFib, or it could be plaque from cholesterol that's broken off and is traveling and um, causing a disruption in the blood flow. So 87% of all strokes are ischemic strokes. The other 13 are the hemorrhagic strokes. Those usually happen because there's a weakness of the blood vessel, like when there's an aneurysm. And when you have hypertension or high blood pressure, it bursts that blood pressure, that blood vessel open. So those are actually more deadly than hemorrhagic strokes. Things that cause strokes, there's a thrombosis that can occur in the large arteries, like the middle cerebral artery in the brain or the smaller arteries in the brain, we call this lacuners. They can be caused by hypertension. There's also embolisms that travel and those come from places like atrial fibrillation because you know the, the atrium is not contracting completely and it makes it high risk for clots. So when you see those commercials for Zeralto and um, uh, and Eliquis and Coumadin does some commercials, but the same thing. That's because we're trying to thin their blood when they have AFib. So there's a 
lower risk of stroke. They still have a risk, but it's a lower risk. People with congestive heart failure are at high risk for stroke. And people with endocarditis are at high risk for stroke because the veg what they call is vegetation on the valves of the heart can break off and travel and cause a stroke as well. There are also brain bleeds. Two different types of brain bleeds are intracerebral. That's when the blood vessel bursts within leaking blood into the brain tissue. And then the subarachnoid, which happens near the surface of the brain and it causes brain blood to go between the brain and the skull. Um, both of these are medical emergencies. A symptom of a bleed is often a sudden headache, the worst headache of my life. So our goal, when we're gonna think about giving a thrombolytic to treat the patients are um, saving the penumbra. So when you look at this picture, the picture that's the dark color where it says area of infarct, that's the core. That's the dead part of the tissue that has already died from the stroke. So we can't really fix, we can't fix that. But that part around is called the penumbra and that's the part we're trying to save. So when you identify a stroke in the field and you bring the patient to the hospital, if, if they're eligible for treatment, that's the part we're trying to save is that penumbra. So they don't have that level of disability that would happen if it also dies. So there are stroke mimics and I'm sure you guys have seen all these in the field. And what I will tell you is when you're in the field and you have stroke symptoms that are B fast, you wanna act on those as if it's a stroke. If it's a sudden onset and it's, and it's a stroke symptom, we're gonna act like it's a stroke. You, is, you don't take time to figure this out in the field if it's alcohol or if it's an infection or an overdose or hypoglycemia, metabolic disorder, Bell's palsy, any of these things, a brain tumor, encephalopathies, you're not going to take the time to figure that because you're not going to have the diagnostics to figure that out in the field. So you're going to identify the symptoms, call on the alert and bring them to the hospital. So here's a quiz. Um, you have a 65 year old woman who is confused and she, but can respond to your questions, but she's confused. She can move her right arm and leg slightly, but with a lot of difficulty. And she feels pulsating, throbbing pain on one side of her head. Her speech is slurred and her mouth is dry. So all these symptoms happen, started in the last half hour. So I want you to think about that scenario and think about what do you think would be her stroke symptoms? If we were doing this in person, I'd make you say it out loud. So. I won't make you do that, but we'll see what they are. So this patient's symptoms were she had difficulty moving her right side. So that's that right-sided weakness or one-sided weakness. She had sudden onset of a headache. That's a stroke symptom. And then the slurred speech. So if you came across this patient, you're, you're called, you come across this patient in the field, what you need to know is when was their last known well? Because remember, that's how we're going to determine if, if she's in a treatment window. And the next thing is, do you have a point of contact for a family member or friend? Because sometimes we have other questions. We want to solidify the last known well. We also want to know what medications there are. If they're on Zeralto, did they take it last night? Or has it been three days because they are off of it because they're having dental work done or they're having a colonoscopy done. So they, they were taken off their anticoagulation. So we might want to call a family member to talk to them about that. Um, are they really confused? We want to talk to make sure they're in agreement because if it's later and we have to transfer them or we have to transfer them downtown we want to make sure they're okay with that if if that's their goal so your part of the stroke management is coming up next so for ems they talk about the the d's of stroke care or the chain of survival so we're going to talk about all these letter d's the first one is detection um, that's that rapid recognition of the stroke symptoms think of be fast so B fast is, B is for balance. So, and E is for I. So when we talk about the B part, that's the poster or the back of the brain. So the back of the brain has the cerebellum, which does balance. And that would be that sudden onset of loss of balance. They got up and they can't walk. And they were, last time they got up, they could walk. Or they're walking, all of a sudden they're starting to walk crooked. Or they feel dizzy all of a sudden. Or they have a crushing headache all the time. That's the cerebellum, the B. They may also have, nausea with this and vomiting with this. Posterior strokes, when you have a posterior stroke affecting the cerebellum, that sudden change of um, loss of balance and dizziness can cause the nausea and vomiting as well. So be alert that if, you're if your patient has a sudden onset loss of balance and nausea as well, 
be concerned that this is a posterior stroke. So we always want to act outside of caution and call it as a posterior stroke or as a possible stroke, because that could be a possible stroke. The other one is uh, E is for eyes. That's in the occipital lobe. That's also in the back of the brain. So this is another posterior stroke circulation. Your patient might have blurred vision. They may have trouble seeing out of one eye, or they may not even be able to see a portion out of one eye. They might have a visual field deficit. Then we move on to FAST. This is the one you've probably heard from American Heart Association. This is the anterior, the front part of the brain. The F is for face. One side is of the face is drooping. A is for arms. So either the arms or the legs are weak. Um, generally on one side can be general, can be kind of both sides, but usually it's one side. Speech. So there's three different ways we look at the speech. One is expressive aphasia. They can't find the words that they need to tell you what they want. They want to say, I, I need a book, and they say, I need a look. They can't, they know they're trying to say something, but they can't find the right words. That's expressive aphasia. The other one is receptive aphasia. You ask them to lift their arm and they lift their leg because they, they know you need something, but they can't figure out what you're saying. They're not processing. And the last one is um, dysarthria, which means slurred speech. So in the hospital, we use the NIH stroke scale and the words we, we ask them to say are baseball player, huckleberry, 50-50. So we ask them to say these words and you may under, you might hear them with slurred speech even before you get to anything like that. So if you think there's slurred speech, that would be a stroke symptom. So if they have any of these symptoms, you're going to call those in as a priority one stroke alert because we want to make sure that we treat them more accurately. And this would be if they have a sudden onset. So once again, for detection, um, this is just another way of looking at the same thing. And it's a sudden, abrupt, or rapid onset. That one sided weakness, it could be the whole side or just maybe the upper arm or the lower leg. A facial droop, you ask them to smile, you count and see if they have the same number of teeth or some uh, gums on both sides. Sensory change, the numbness um, or tingling, especially on one side. A language change. We talked about the ability to find the right word or to understand the dysarthria. That's when they can't speak because their tongue is not working correctly. It's a, a tongue muscle um, disorder, but that is a stroke symptom. The visual changes that we talked about, even and they may have resolved, resolved by the time you got there, but if they had visual changes, that's a stroke symptom. That gait disturbance we talked about. Um, the next one is decline in level of consciousness. So if they become very drowsy, very lethargic, and they weren't before, that could be a couple of things. One, it could be a brain bleed that's gotten worse. It could be a large stroke that's gotten bigger, or it could be a brainstem infarct because any of those can cause that loss of consciousness. We already talked about dizziness and loss of balance and that severe headache with no known cause. So big important takeaways, if your patient has any of these symptoms, you need to find out when their last known well was because that's what we're gonna ask us so we know how to treat this patient. Um, so detection, other symptoms, there can be respiratory ab abnormalities um, that usually happens when there's a brainstem infarct, there can be difficulty swallowing the swallow, um, the tongue is involved in many parts of the brain, and when we look at that, the dysarthria can happen, the nausea and vomiting, the neglect, vertigo, um, tinnitus, that ringing in the ear, they can have weakness bilaterally, and they can have numbness on both sides. So this video is about neglect, so we're going to show part of this. Um, because neglect is something that people have trouble identifying sometimes. Oops, it's not working, Amy. It's not clear what they're showing. I know because there's no audio. Um, yeah, so what they're trying to show is, and I'm not sure what the audio is on because it did when I tried it before. Is your audio not on, Amy, on your computer? That might be why. All right, so I'll just talk you through. So what they're doing is they're touching each arm and then they're, they're saying, which arm can you feel? And she'll say, I can feel the left, I can feel the right, I can feel both. And that's when there's no neglect. But when she has neglect, they'll say, 
can when you touch the right they can feel the right they can feel the left and then they'll then they'll do both and she'll only feel the left because she can't she's her mind is blocking out the other side. So see on that one, when he had to hit both sides, she only, she only raised her right hand because she only hear, could feel the right side. So um, that's just showing neglect that people do have that. So we'll just go past that one, Amy. I'm not sure it's not working. So um, for dispatch, so that means we're going to activate, they're going to call you early and we're going to dispatch EMS. And so why do we want patients to come by EMS? Because then you guys call us and we're ready for you at the hospital. So we, we can have the, the CT table clear, we get their, their stroke reviewed and we can get things done. All right. Um, so delivery, once again, rapid identification, management and transport. Know the last known well, the difference from onset of symptoms is different from last known well. So if the patient went to bed at nine o'clock at night and they woke up at 3 a.m. and they got they have symptoms when they woke up but they were fine when they went to bed, the last known well is nine o'clock at night. Somewhere in the middle of the stroke happened, we don't know when, but that's that's the last known well. So you want to make sure you establish that because that does make sure that they're let us know when they're eligible. So they might be eligible for the clot removal, even if they're out of the window for um, a thrombolytic. So that, that's what we always want to know when they're within 24 hours. All right, so the EMS protocol, this is part of your protocol. You wanna get the phone number of one or more individuals who have the knowledge of the patient's presenting symptoms, um, their last known well and their medical history. This is actually in the Maryland protocol for you guys. So that's what we always ask. And we ask that it be part of your report to us and on the short form as well. So the Cincinnati stroke scale, that would be the, the fast part of the BFAST, the facial droop, the arm drift. So you wanna have, hold their arms up and for 10 seconds and see if they fall um, in the abnormal speech. So then we talk about the posterior circulations that we talked about before. So balance, you can see the, the yellow triangle, a yellow star with the blue in the middle is for balance. And then I have it starred the same way um, of the cerebellum picture in the bottom. And then the eyes are the yellow in the middle and blue on the outside. And that's the occipital lobe. So if any of these signs of the Cincinnati are positive, if one of three is abnormal, then the probability of stroke is 72%. So that's why we have you do those on these patients. All right, so your algorithm. Um, so first, of course, we're gonna check the ABCs, make sure their, their breathing, the circulation is clear. Um, you're gonna get their glucose. Hypoglycemia is a stroke mimic. So we always get their glucose in the hospital and in the field. Um, you're gonna do the posterior cerebellar assessment that we talked about, looking for the acute onset of dizziness, um, nausea, vomiting, and then um, blurred vision. You do the Cincinnati scale. If any of those are positive for stroke, then you're gonna see what we do next. If they're not, you're gonna transport per whatever the presentation is. But if they are abnormal, what do you think you're gonna do next? You're gonna do the LAMB score. So if the Cincinnati is positive, you wanna do the LAMB score. Cause now we're looking to see, is this a large vessel occlusion? So the LAMB score has three parts to it. One is the facial droop. If, it, if they have a facial droop, they get one point. The next is arm drift. If it's absent, it's zero. If it drifts down slowly, they get a one. If you lift up and it falls down right away, that's a two. The grip strength, you ask them to grip your hand. If it's normal, it's zero. If it's weak, they get a one. And if there's no grip, they can't grip you at all, they get a two. So if they're four or higher, that's very highly indicative of a large vessel occlusion. And if it's less than 22 hours from the last known well, we want you to call us so we know. Um, and if it's if they're four or greater, we're probably going to say, are you within 30 minutes for a comprehensive stroke center? Because that's where they should be going. Because um, that's our pro the protocol. So once again, this is the, these algorithms are right from the um, MIMS EMS uh, coding. So determine the last known well and their LAMS assessment. If their signs and symptoms of stroke are consistent with an onset less than 22 hours, if there's LAMS is not four or greater, you're gonna go right to a stroke center, the closest stroke center. If they're four or greater, you're gonna to go to a comprehensive stroke center. If they're within 31 minutes or within 30 minutes 
of arrival by driving. So if you're trying to get there and they're an hour away, go to the, the closest primary stroke center. Um, but if they're within 30 minutes, you go to the comprehensive stroke center. And if the LAMS is less than four, you would go to the closest stroke center. So management of the patient when you have them, you're gonna put the head at 30 degrees. If their blood sugar is less than 79, you're gonna treat them per the hypoglycemia protocol. You wanna get an IV access, preferably on the side that's not affected. Um, if they're hypotensive, you wanna get a medical consult. Um, you're gonna call in the box and you wanna get a blood test sample using a closed system if possible. We do not want to treat hypertension in the field. The reason for this is if the patient is having a, an ischemic stroke and we lower their blood pressure quickly, they will actually have an increased stroke because they don't have enough blood flow to their brain. It's called a hypoperfusion stroke. So we keep their blood pressure um, elevated when they until they get here. Now, if it's obscenely elevated, and you would definitely get a consult because you're calling in a, a this is a stroke alert anyway, um, and they may ask you to treat it, but we generally allow permissive hypertensive and we treat them when they get in. Um, because of course, if their blood pressure is way too high, then we end up having a hemorrhagic conversion of the stroke, which isn't good either. Hey, Karen, I've heard the preference is to have a more proximal IV, like an anacube. Is that true? So not necessarily. So when we, when we ask for it, they want it above the wrist and they don't always want it in the anacubital because then of course, when they bend it, we, we prefer a 20. That's basically what they want. They want a 20 because they want to do it. If they need to do a CTA, it needs to be a 20. Um, but it doesn't matter if it's in the hand or in the anacube. I haven't heard that. Have you have heard anything about that, Amy? Usually above the wrist. Yeah, above the wrist is what they ask for. Yeah. That's and that's that's actually CT that asked for it. They wanted above the wrist. I think because they're they're a fear of um, issues with the contrast if they put it below the wrist. So above the wrist um, and a twenty is what they ask for. Um, so if they're within twenty four hour twenty two hours less than well. What's important? The last known well, right? So here's here's something. If the patient woke up at 7 a.m., their left arm is flaccid, their left leg is weak, they have slurred speech, they're ending up with a lambs of four. Um, but their last known well, we're not quite sure. But we know that they were out to lunch at 12 o'clock yesterday and at 12 o'clock lunch, somewhere around 12 o'clock that they were good. So we know they're within 22 hours. If you can't nail it down exactly, but you know they're within 22 hours, call it in and bring them in. And then we'll look to see if we can find them that can support the last known well, because we're gonna run with that and we're gonna do the, the, the perfusion scan to see where they are, if they, if they have a viable clot that can be removed and if the um, ratio is such that they can take them down within that expanded window. So we always wanna know if they're anywhere within a 24 hour thing, bring them in that way as a stroke alert. So it's important because it activates the stroke alert in the ED. So when they get to the ED, this is what happens. So we're going to ask, when was the last known? Well, the nurse puts in order sets at our hospital of less than four and a half hours or greater than four and a half hours. Um, if they're less than four and a half hours and their symptoms are completed, like they're all gone, we're going to do a, a brain attack CT without bringing the whole team in because they're still at risk because that could, maybe that's a TIA. And you know, if they've had a TIA, they can wax and wane before they get to the big stroke. So we're still gonna do that brain attack CT right away. And it could also be a bleed. So we're gonna make, see what's going on. Um, when you call, we activate the brain attack team. So they are ready. We know the CT, we go to CT with you. If it's less than four and a half hours, rather than four and a half and less than 22, um, they're evaluated by the ED provider to see if they need a mechanical thrombectomy. Um, and the reason for that is we just want to see, make sure there, there are certain patients that wouldn't go. So um, we have them look at it, look for that large vessel occlusion indication. So data. So why is the CT important for these patients? We're looking for that blood, right? So the first scan is a clean um, CAT scan. There's nothing wrong with that brain. So that's good when you're having stroke symptoms because that means we could probably treat you. The second one's got the blood. We're not giving you TPA and we might have to consider sending you down for a drain or, or a craniotomy. Um, and the third one is ischemic stroke, so it's too late. So Alteplace or um, 
connect up place, they are both thrombolytics, they're weight-based. So this is our scale that we have in our CT suite that actually rolls your stretcher onto it. We weigh the patient on the stretcher, put them on the CAT scan table, and then we have you put the stretcher back on empty and we weigh it again. Um, to, and we calculate the weights. So we know what weight we have for the dosing. Um, things we ask for you, the past medical history. Do you know that they, if they've had a stroke before? Do you know if they're on anticoagulation? Do they have AFib? Are they having new AFib for you? Those are the things you want to know. Have they had a recent surgery? Are they on medications? Are they on an antiplatelet? Are they on anticoagulation? Do they take Coumadin? So then we'll wait to get an INR before we proceed with doing anything else. Um, do we have a family member contact? And we want the short form at the time you get there so we have this information. We spend a lot of time actually, and I, and I heard a, a, a conference about this as well, that when you when the patient comes in and we don't have information, we take a long time to try to track down the family members to find out, did they get these, did they take these meds and when did they take them? So another th trick that I've heard on the conference was as EMS, if you have time, if the family member wants to put the, the pill bottles in a bag, put them in a bag and bring them with you because then we can see exactly what they're taking. So mm -hmm. if you have time to gather that extra second or two, that'll help us because then we'll know what they're on as well. All right, next slide. So what labs are important for these patients? The glucose, because hypoglycemia can mimic a stroke. So we know if a person's blood sugar is low, they can be lethargic, they can be confused, they can have weakness and they can have slurred speech. So we always are gonna get their blood glucose. If they're hyperglycemic, so their blood sugar is high, that's not good for giving a thrombolytic that makes them more prone to bleeding. So we wanna know that too. Their platelet count, if their platelet's way too low, we're not gonna give them a blood thinner. And their coagulation time. So this looks at um, their PT and their INR. This looks at um, if they are on Coumadin and normally for Coumadin, your, your INR level that we like is between 2.0 and 3.0. If they're less than 1.7 they're, and they're having stroke symptoms, they're subtherapeutic and they can actually get um, a thrombolytic IV um, if there's no other thing to hold them back because they aren't, they aren't anticoagulated enough. So that's why those are important. Um, two IVs are liked if we can get them. Sometimes, and the reason for that is sometimes we have to start another line for um, blood pressure management. So that's why we like to have two lines. So if you can get two lines in, great. If you can't, get one in and that's good too. Um, so these are the assessment tools that are used by the ED provider. The one on the left is the NIH stroke scale and it's 11 different categories. Our nurses do this as well. Um, and this is, it's very precise. It's like a neuro exam, <clears throat> but there's a lot of rules with it. So you have to be trained to do it. And then you have them, Describe the picture below, we have them describe it. We're looking to see their fluency of speech. Do they miss anything? Like if they have neglect, they may not see anything on the left side of the page. So we're looking for that as well. We look for the fluency of reading the words and can they identify these common objects? So the problem with this is it was actually developed when they um, did the research for Alteplase and that was first thought to be for anterior circulation strokes to so that FAST part, the Cincinnati, that's what this was developed for. So even mm -hmm. our doctors, when we do posterior strokes, it doesn't get picked up with this tool. So it's it's a very tricky um, thing to pick up. Yeah, there's a question or a hand raised. I don't know if um, they want to put oh. it in the chat or. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm, I had to put it down because I couldn't see the pictures. So oh, um, yeah, Karen, this is Carolyn McHenry. Just to go okay. back to your IV and, and placement, Yes. Um, if they're going to do a CTA, you have to have like the mid forearm or higher because that's how it's it, the contrast, um, how long it takes to get to where it needs to be. If it's too low, then um, it, it won't, you won't get a good, a good catch I'm not on. saying it right, but it has to be like four, like mid forearm or higher if oh, they're going to do a to CTA. Because they always tell us above the wrist. Um, and not and it has to be a form. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you work as a tech too? Um, I did. I okay. actually, um, I'm actually in South Carolina right now Aww. and, um, I moved down here in July and, um, I'm working as paramedic down here 
And I'm actually very excited to be part of Sean's class again because I've missed them. Aww. So I'm glad you joined anyway, us. Thank you. And I hope you don't get hit by the hurricane too much. Uh, it poured today. I bet. Oh, but I was off. So. <laughs> well, thank you for the feedback. That's awesome. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next slide. Um, so why do we need to do a CTA of the head and neck? So if that large vessel, if that lamp score is four or greater and they've come to our hospital, because sometimes what happens too is they may have a lambs of two for you and strokes don't know when, when to stop. They might be progressing. So it might get worse and root or might get worse when they're with us. So then we do a lambs as well. And if we think there's a large vessel occlusion, um, we will do a CTA of the head and neck because that's actually looking for the clot. So when you look at this at A where the arrow is, that's the clot. And when you look at B, you can see where there's no blood flow there, where there's like a breakup, um, different from the other side. And you um do you do you have a pointer on your computer? Oh no, it's Amy's. Yeah, it's but the Amy's. pointer works. Yeah. Can you just describe it again? What the pointer? Um, yeah, so this is actually the clot, and this is on the CTA. Or on the on the CT scan and then on the CTA where this one is, you can see this is the description of blood flow. Because if you look at the opposite side of the same one, see how there's there's blood vessels going all the way through, and then the other one there's like a, an empty area there. So um, that's actually the clot that they were showing. Perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so then what, how do we decide what we're going to do? Um, so first, this is what the ED provider needs. He needs that negative head CT, so there's no bleed on the CT. We need to know exactly when the last known well time was. They have to figure out that NIH so we can figure out their stroke score. We have to see which labs we absolutely have to have, like the glucose. And if they're on coma, then we have to have the INR. And then there's a whole long list of inclusion exclusion criteria, and they review that to see if the patient is eligible for, for um, thrombolytic therapy. And then they look to see, are they eligible for, for endovascular therapy? They look at things like, um, what did this patient do at home? Are they um, able-bodied, they, they work at home, or are they someone who's bed bound? So that's, that's something for you, nothing for you, some, not for you to decide in the field, but that's the consideration that goes underway when we call neurology and decide what's gonna be done for these patients. So the fibrolytic therapy, that's for the clogged plumbing. So the gold standard is zero to three hours from last known well. So that is all to place right now. And then that extended window is the three to four hours. Um, and then we have the inclusion exclusion criteria. It's three to four and a half hours actually. Um, Right now we're using Altaplace. That is the FDA approved drug. Tenecteplace has been in trials and then trials has been found to be non-inferior to Altaplace, which means it works as well as Altaplace. It's not better, it's not worse, it works the same. And it's actually found to have better, what they call fibrin specificity. Um, so it, it works better, it works faster. It has a longer half-life. So whereas when we give Altaplace, you have to mix the drug, pull out what's not needed from the bottle, that's called the waste, pull out the bolus, we give the bolus over a minute, and then we have to hang the rest of the drug, drug over an hour. Um, to connect the place, we have to mix it, and then we pull out the dose we give, and then we give it um, through IV push over five seconds, and then flush with 10 cc's of normal saline. It's a big difference. Um, and then the other advantage to that is when we have to, if these patients get a thrombolytic and then we need to transfer them down to Sinai or downtown someone for, for a thrombectomy, right now, if they're still getting an alta place, we have to have an RN or an ALS level crew to go with them. Um, if they got to neck the place, they can go uh, with a, a regular crew. So it makes it a little easier. All right. Um, so the large vessel occlusions, those are those LVOs that we talk about. Weave their way up the brain and they pull it out the clot. Um, sometimes they fully sedate the patient, sometimes they do twilight. It's kind of up to how that well they think the patient's gonna stay still. Um, and they do intubate these patients, but not always. 
um, it's kind of a provider decision um, in IR about that. And then um, these are within 24 hours. So we actually had a patient who came to us. He came in through the waiting room. He got worse while he was there. Um, we called downtown. He, when we sent him down, he had lost, I think it was the left side. He didn't have any um, functioning. He wasn't able to speak. He was confused. We sent him um, down to University of Maryland Medical Center and he went home walking three days later because they got the clot out. So it does work and it's really exciting when we can make that happen. Um, so the next thing I was talking about is that, that imaging. So if a patient um, is greater than six, it looks like it's a large vessel occlusion, their LAMPS is four or greater, the NIH is six is greater, and it's more than six hours since they had, um, since they're last known well, then we do the perfusion scan. That's what this is a picture of. The pink on the, on the screen is the actual core of the stroke. So that's the actual dead tissue. The green is the penumbra. That's the part that, that takes longer to get the dye through. And that's the part they're, they're afraid that's at risk. So if that, if the profile mismatches up to 70 cc's for the core um, and the mismatch profile, was, it was in the target. These are the ones that they'll take down for a thrombectomy. And this patient right here, and I hope the volume works on it. She actually had a thrombectomy um, with this rapid. She was our first rapid patient. July the 3rd, um, I was home and she was home with my brother. My brother lives with her. She had gone into the bathroom and she fell. And she had asked my brother to help her, not realizing that she had even had a stroke. So my brother listened to her talk and right away her speech was very garbled. I told my brother, I said, call 911. Um, and see if they can take her to St. Joe's. My name is Ben Van Landingham. I'm one of the attending emergency doctors at St. Joe's emergency room. I was on duty at seven in the morning when Mrs. Coos came out. This case was fairly easy from a diagnostic point of view because the medics were able to recognize her appropriately as soon as they saw her that it looked like she was having a stroke affect her family and figured as much as well. And so we have a system uh, of learning us and talking ahead of time to, to make us aware that they're bringing in somebody who appears to have just had a stroke. So, so when she arrived, we have a setup in our hospital where we where we meet the patient in the ambulance room as soon as they arrive before they even go into it. And we start talking uh, right then and there. And so I accompanied Mrs. Coos straight to the CAT scan suite. And we talked, and as I began to examine her, one sec, they got me into the emergency room. They were like right on top of things, you know, taking care of me. I remember the doctor coming in asking me where I was at and how I felt and what day of the month was it and all that. And I knew all that. When she arrived at seven in the morning, the last known well time was one in the morning. That's when we were able to say she was fine then. And then she recalled falling on the ground and uh, was able to tell me that she didn't hurt herself and didn't have any pain. But we knew that she was out of the window for the intravenous, which is the newest uh, a tool. It, it is, is the opportunity for the right patient to be referred down to the University Medical Center for this inpatient intervention therapy. The only major treatment option that she had was uh, interventional therapy in the form of trying to uh, put a catheter up in the brain and uh, pull out the clot. And so they called University of Maryland Medical Center uh, promptly and reached a member of our stroke team. Uh, and then she was uh, transferred to University of Maryland Medical Center and uh, was uh, treated. Well, once the patient arrived, we worked closely with Dr. Chetavetti and the stroke neurology team to ensure that the patient's imaging suggested that the benefit the risk ratio of the procedure was such that the chance the patient benefiting was high enough that we should take her to the end just so we can try to reopen the blocked vessel. 
So on the left of the screen, we have the pre-treatment imaging. It's a side view of the brain while we're injecting contrast in the main carotid artery. And we can see that there's a large area that's not receding direct or forward blood flow in this region, which should all be filled with black blood vessels. And we can see that there's none here because of a blockage down below the base of the brain. After our treatment, after we were successful removing the clots, in the same sort of side view, we can see this whole area is now filled with these dark blood vessels. We can actually begin to see some of the contrast going out um, because it follows the pathway of the blood actually into the tissue. So you can actually see this, this sort of hazy grayness on the on this image on the right is actually an indication that we restored the blood flow to that area of the brain that was affected by the stroke. When she presented with a, a stroke of this severity, uh, to be discharged within three days is uh, amazing. And uh, I think that is a testament to the fact that uh, St. Joseph Hospital uh, got her to the University of Maryland very quickly, and, uh, and Dr. Miller was able to treat her uh, quickly as well. And so all of those factors really uh, ensured her uh, best chance for recovery. It was amazing how everybody just worked together because time was a real issue with getting this clot out. I didn't expect to see her today, but we had a chance to meet. And the last time I saw her was on July 3rd in the emergency department. And what a joy to see her looking so well on her feet, walking without a cane. Her daughter, Lisa, who had been in St. Joe's emergency with me, uh, was there that morning. And I told them that to see her doing so well now, three months later, is, is, is exactly what we need to get through every long, hard day. This outcome is inspiring. Everything we do was well. I just give God all the credit because it wasn't for the Lord. I, I wouldn't be here. Because I think He was really looking out for me. All right. So I wanted to share that with you guys because that is actually a story that came true because she was brought to us by EMS in a timely manner. We did the perfusion scan and she made it down there. So you guys are integral to the care of these patients. And I want you to realize that there are really good endings um, that are at play as well. Karen, can I also add what, one thing that I really appreciate about this story was at the very beginning was that you know, a lot of these calls for our EMS providers don't come out as strokes, right? They come out as falls. Or so, you know, it wasn't long ago, I was on a call in one of our senior living centers and it was a fall in the hallway. And as soon as we went to get the guy and talk to him and say, how are you? What's going on? Did you fall? You know, you could immediately tell that he was, you know, dysarthric and, and had weakness on one side. So, yeah, they don't always come out as strokes. So I really appreciate that. Right. Yeah, and that's true. We see that a lot that the call, because I look at all the EMS um, documents as well, and I can see, oh, call for change in mental status, called for a fall or called for shortness of breath sometimes, and they're an a new onset AFib and they're having a stroke. So we really rely on you guys and our, our citizens rely on you to identify these quickly. So that's so why I wanted to share that story with you all. All right, go to the next slide. So our goal is to get them down there in 90 minutes. It's a lofty goal, but we try. Um, and then when they, when the patient gets down, down downtown, they have 15 minutes to figure out if this is indeed someone they're gonna try to do a clot retrieval on, and then they try to get to the groin in under 60 minutes. So this one below is, I mean, they showed you on the video too, but this is another um, case. The red arrow shows where the clot is and there's like no blood flow behind it. And then the yellow, this was one of our patients actually, another one of our patients. The yellow shows when they got the reperfusion and how the blood flow is going much better afterwards. So it's really pretty amazing. Um, and so then what happens next when these patients? So if they're not getting the thrombolytic, if they're getting a thrombolytic, they're going to go to the ICU um, or they're going to be transferred to a, a comprehensive stroke center if they need, a th they need to have um, a thrombectomy. If they don't get a thrombolytic, they're going to go to the ICU if they have comorbidities that require the ICU or they're going to go to a telemetry unit or we're going to, again, transfer them if it's a bleed. So, so 
Take home points, the Ds for stroke are detection. So that's that early recognition by the family and by you all when you get there. Um, early activation, we wanna teach people to call 911. So I don't know if you're aware that Maryland is, called, uh, is a stroke smart state now. If you go onto MIMS uh, website, it actually has a page for stroke smart Maryland. And we are working on making a video um, about stroke awareness and stroke smart that we're hoping to get distributed. So um, Kenny Barajas of MIMS is helping us do that. And we wanna teach you about early activation, the activation and recognition of um, stroke symptoms. Uh, delivery, EMS, identification and communication is calling us letting us know that we have a, a, a stroke alert coming in. The door, we get to the primary stroke center, the comprehensive stroke center. The data is that triage information that they're going to tell us. The last known well, the history, what medication they were on. The decision, is that's what the brain attack decide, team decides if they're um, going to get a thrombolytic or they're going to get a mechanical thrombectomy or if it's they're not candidates for either of those, what are we going to do for this patient? Um, and that's also the drug there. And the disposition, do we keep them and, and as an inpatient or do we need to transfer them out? So there's also some special cases of stroke, and this comes right from the EMS um, criteria from MIMS, and they went on to remind people that mothers to be in postpartum mothers, postpartum mothers both have an increased risk, and that's because they have what's called hypercoagulability um, in their in their blood system, so they have a higher chance of having blood clots. So you always want to be alert of stroke symptoms in this this population, um, and strokes can also happen in kids. Um, Children under 18 are, are not the same as adults and they can have strokes. We actually had a patient recently, um, he was at football practice, I believe. He it was in the summer or late summer and he was having symptoms and the school nurse called mom and mom to come pick him up and mom took brought him to our pediatric, pediatric after hours at the time. Um, and he was having a stroke but no one thought he was having a stroke because kids don't have strokes. But this kid actually did have a stroke. Um, so the symptoms are the same. The one thing I will say, sometimes children will have seizures with their strokes. Uh, the risk factors for kids are, are heart defects, infections like meningitis or encephalitis. They can have a brain injury. They have a blood disorder like a sickle cell disease. Uh, if they're under 18, you want to give two to six liters of nasal cannula unless they're hypoxic or in a respiratory distress. You want to have, get their contact information and you want to contact the nearest pediatric base station, which would be Hopkins. Um, for the pediatric stroke cases. So I'm Karen, Amy's on the other, uh, he's controlling our, our pictures here. And then Kelly is our EMS liaison. So I don't know if you all have met Kelly Patrilock, um, but she usually works on the weekends. Uh, so you may run to her as well. So at this time we'll ask if you guys have any questions that we can Thanks, answer Karen. for you. Thank you, thank you. One of the things you and I talked about before we opened the session was some of the challenges of getting patients transferred if they should have gone to a thrombectomy center or a comprehensive center, but providers, you know, yeah, weren't sure or for whatever the reason brought them to a primary center and just some of the challenges that we experienced getting these patients then transferred. Yeah, that's true. Um, so sometimes we have patients, we've had patients that have had a sudden onset of stroke symptoms. And um, if their LAMP score is four or higher, of course, we're going to send them to a comprehensive stroke center. Um, and the reason for that is one, if they come to us, then we have to transfer them and we have to get transportation for them. And if you guys have already left, we have to look for transportation. And sometimes it's not so easy. We've also have patients come in with brain bleeds. Um, and then it's really hard to find a bed for a patient with a brain bleed. There's not a lot of beds available anywhere in the state, as you know, for pediatrics, for adults, for brain bleeds. So it really is best if we can get these patients to the right place on the, at the right time. Um, so we don't have to worry about um, trying to find transportation for them. Yeah, so maybe if providers, you know, certainly, you know, sometimes the information that we have is incomplete or, you know, we don't have as much experience as you guys. And, you know, if we have concerns or questions or not sure, sometimes it's helpful to bring in two centers for a consult and let, you know, two ED docs decide where, do, where, do, where should we go? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I will say, if you call in the box and you say, you know, there are lambs as a four, um, but I'm not sure, you know, 
just call them. We'll, we'll ask. And sometimes we've had, pa- we've had patients come in like, well, they have this, this, and this symptom, but their lamps is a one. And we're like, hmm, I think that's probably more like a four. So we may question you if we're doing the math because our nurses in the triage room, they actually, when patients walk in through the ED, we do the LAMP score to figure out if they're a large vessel occlusion as well. So they're pretty well versed in it. So they might um, ask you about that. Let's, let's talk about this, make sure we're sending them to the right, pay, right place because we definitely want patients getting to the right place so they get the right resources that they need. Any other questions or comments for Karen and Amy? I also put a link in the chat. Uh, keep an eye out on that. If you click the link, fill in some information, you get your CEUs. Okay. Is there anything? I have a question. Sure. So down here, this is Carol Ann again, they do a race score. How mm-hmm. does that correlate to like the LAM score? Is that? Um... Same idea. It's just a little different. Um, I'm trying to think of what the race is. Um, hold on. I had it pulled up right now. Yeah, I mean, the, it's it, it's actually, I mean, the LAM score is easier if you ask me because there's less to, it has, um, there's like one, two, three, four, five, six categories. So it has facial palsy, arm motor function, leg motor function, gaze uh, deviation, aphasia, and um, agnosia, okay. agnosia. Right, so they're pulling in more of the cortical symptoms because if you have a patient that has primary um, aphasia and that's their only symptom, and Amy can actually tell you about this as well, um, that they might be having a large vessel occlusion and they're not scoring high on the LAMP score. Um, okay. So Amy, do you want to share your story? I hate to put you on the spot, but. Sure. I don't mind. I just have a personal story. Um, my father was on vacation in Florida last February and he had some just trouble speaking. And of course, no one called me and told me, but they kind of sat around all day. Um, uh, finally, they able, they talked to me to go to the hospital. And um, when he got there, his lamb score was only a two or three, I think. But the ER doctor was concerned because of his symptoms. Um, and so they ended up doing the CTA and he had a large vessel occlusion, which they went in and did um, a thrombectomy and were able to remove the clot. And he's had a full recovery since. Yeah, so that's, you know, we have the LAM score and it picks up most of it, but there are all these, all these, those exceptions. So I think that's where the race comes in more is they're looking for the aphasia as well. But I will say, if you ever have a patient and you're, you're truly concerned about them, call it in, you know, we, we, we want to make sure they get to the right place. So we've had success stories and we, and we also know that there are a lot of people who wait for days before they come in. And that breaks my heart because if they've had the symptoms for four days, they're out of the window and they still need to be brought in. We still need to figure out what caused their stroke. If it was definitely a stroke, um, we need to talk about how they can prevent another stroke but we really want to get them boarding out. So if, even in your, anywhere you go in your walk of life, if you share the BFAST mnemonic with people and teach them the, the symptoms of a stroke, um, that would be helping everybody out because then they'll learn. And the more we teach, the more it spreads and then the more people we can help. So. Well said. Karen, maybe I'm just going to stop the recording, but I certainly want to get the recording of just yeah, just how much we appreciate you guys and spending time with us in the late evening hours to, yeah, share this incredibly important uh, education and tons of accolades coming in on the chat. Thank you. I hope you guys are seeing that. I am seeing. Thank you so much, guys. And I appreciate you all taking time to listen to us. Um, It means a lot when people show up. So thank you. All right.